Good afternoon. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the Executive Director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series entitled Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Uh, this webinar is a uh, collaboration between uh, ACMT and the uh, PACU, uh, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit Program, and it's part of a mini series on safer disinfecting use in COVID-19. And the presentation today will be on hand sanitizers in the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Um, this is a disclaimer that this uh, presentation is supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and funded by a cooperative agreement with uh, ATSDR. And the content in this presentation does not represent the views of the present, uh, represents the views of the presenter, does not represent the views of the CDC and the ATSDR. Next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series uh, partners for helping to uh, get the word out about this webinar series to uh, associations from uh, around the world. Much appreciated uh, as always. Next slide. Uh, this webinar uh, will be recorded and put in our uh, webinar video gallery uh, which is up on uh, both the ACMT website and is accessible from the PACU website. Um, and it's a safe disinfecting use mini web series uh, video gallery. This is a, the third in a series of, of webinars. Um, and uh, the, the last two webinars you can see on the screen and you have access to them on, on demand as well as this webinar. Next slide. We also have a series of frequently asked questions that have been developed uh, uh, based on each of the webinars, and this is available on the website as well. And uh, uh, an additional uh, uh, FAQ developed uh, uh, for this uh, webinar today. Next slide. And there will be a Q and A at the end of the webinar. This often goes on for uh, 15, uh, 15 to twenty minutes, and we encourage you to write your questions in to the Q and A function during the webinar. And we'll try to get to as many as the questions as possible, and we monitor uh, all the platforms that we broadcast on. Next slide. I'd like to thank my uh, co-moderator and co-leader of, of, our, of, of our program, Dr. Zad Kazi, Secretary Treasurer of ACMT, the past president of the Middle East and North African Clinical Toxicology Association, and the Associate Professor of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University. Next slide. Our speakers do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. Um, I'd like to now introduce our guest uh, moderator, Dr. Carl Baum. Uh, Dr. Baum is the medical director of the PACU program um, and is a professor of pediatrics and of emergency medicine at Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. Uh, he's an, uh, um, a pediatrician, a medical toxicologist, a pediatric emergency medicine specialist, and an environmental medicine specialist. And he will be uh, uh, framing today's uh, talk before our uh, uh, keynote speaker and will be introducing our speaker and our other uh, guest moderator. Uh, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, as Paul said, there will be a Q&A at the end. So if you don't mind just holding your questions until then, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, before I introduce our uh, guest moderator and our guest speaker, I just wanted to frame the discussion by providing a background case. Uh, so this, this is a made up case, but it's not atypical. Uh, a toddler pumps a small amount of hand sanitizer onto his palm and licks it. His mother calls the clinic with concerns about alcohol poisoning, but adds that she's also worried about various contaminants she's read about on social media. So the question is, how much is a lick for a toddler? We, we think a lot about mouthfuls for different size people, toddlers or adults, but how much is a lick? Hard to uh, quantify that. Uh, what we could do is consider a worst case scenario for an entire pump of a typical hand sanitizer bottle. Uh, if you uh, take a, a, a tablespoon or a teaspoon, one pump is, is roughly uh, a third of a teaspoon or about two mLs. Uh, the dose therefore of ethanol in a typical hand sanitizer bottle would be about 800 milligrams of ethanol about 1 20th of a standard alcoholic drink. So if you distribute that dose, quote unquote, into a typical toddler who might be 10 or 12 kilos, you would get a theoretical blood alcohol concentration at maximum, a peak of 11 milligrams per deciliter, which is uh, 
maybe enough to cause some mild symptoms, but uh, certainly wouldn't rise to a level of severe intoxication. Next slide, please. So in terms of answering the mother's other question about contaminants, how do these contaminants end up in hand sanitizers? And which of the contaminants uh, have been reported uh, in social media and uh, mainstream media as well? Well, the, the most alarming one uh, that we hear about reported to poison centers and, and otherwise is methanol. Uh, there have been some serious poisonings uh, with methanol being substituted for ethanol or contaminating ethanol. There's also uh, case reports of one propanol uh, as opposed to two propanol, which of course is isopropyl alcohol, the other typical uh, ingredient of some hand sanitizers. Uh, finally, and more recently, benzene uh, has been reported. This is the subject of a pending petition. And for that reason, FDA cannot yet comment on uh, that specific contaminant. There's a website there. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our guest moderator. Uh, that's Dr. Teresa Michelle. Uh, Dr. Michelle is director of the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs in the Office of New Drugs and the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US Food and Drug Administration. And then our guest speaker is Dr. Evelyn Mentari. Dr. Mentari is acting deputy director for safety in the division of non-prescription drugs and the Office of Non-Prescription Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the US FDA. So with that, I will now introduce uh, Dr. Mentari and uh, uh, Dr. Michelle will be available to help moderate some of the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Baum, and thank you to the American College of Medical Toxicology for inviting me to speak. Today, I will discuss how FDA has responded to the increased demand for alcohol-based hand sanitizers during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I will also discuss hand sanitizer safety issues that have evolved during this time. Next slide. The opinions and information in this presentation are my own and do not reflect the views and policies of FDA. Next slide. Our learning objectives for today are to describe issues related to the hand sanitizer shortage during the COVID-19 pandemic, discuss new and increasing safety issues with hand sanitizers, including issues that are of particular concern in pediatric populations, and identify ways to prevent toxic hand sanitizer exposures. Next slide. Topics I will discuss today include the role of hand sanitizer in hand hygiene, how hand sanitizers are regulated in the United States, as well as the hand sanitizer shortage during the COVID-19 pandemic and FDA's actions to address this shortage. I'll also provide an overview of new and increasing safety issues with hand sanitizers, as well as a discussion of safety issues, including accidental ingestion by children, contamination with methanol or 1-propanol, ocular injuries, and flammability. Next slide. I will start by discussing hand sanitizer in the context of overall hand hygiene recommendations. Hand hygiene is an integral part of the response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. As advised by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, the best way for consumers to prevent the spread of infections and decrease the risk of getting sick is by washing your hands with plain soap and water. If soap and water are not available, CDC recommends that consumers use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Next slide. Hand sanitizers are over-the-counter or OTC antiseptics, which are drugs regulated by FDA. For some additional context, I will talk for a little bit about how hand sanitizers are regulated in the United States. There are a number of different categories of over-the-counter antiseptics, which are sorted based on indication and population of use. 
For the purposes of this talk, I am focusing primarily on consumer antiseptic hand rubs, which are known as hand sanitizers, and are leave-on products that are not rinsed off with water. There is overlap with products used in the healthcare personnel hand rub category, and the FDA temporary guidances on hand sanitizers, which I will discuss later in this presentation, apply to both categories. Next slide. In the United States, hand sanitizers are regulated as non-prescription drugs. There are two ways to bring a non-prescription drug to market in the U.S the new drug application process, and the OTC drug review process, also known as the OTC drug monograph process. These processes are quite different. Under the new drug application process, which is how prescription drugs also come to market, an application for the drug is submitted to FDA for approval. The application includes information about the safety and effectiveness of the drug. The drug can't be marketed until FDA approves the application for the drug. The application is specific for a particular drug product, including its formulation, dose, use, and labeling. In contrast to the new drug application process, an OTC monograph drug can be marketed without FDA approval if the drug complies with the requirements in Section 505G of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, as well as applicable conditions of its therapeutic category-specific OTC monograph. We will talk more about what an OTC monograph is in just a moment. Except for any final formulation testing specified in relevant monographs, a manufacturer that is following an OTC monograph does not need to provide safety and effectiveness data for each individual drug product. This is because OTC monographs establish conditions, including active ingredients, under which an OTC drug is considered generally recognized as safe and effective, or GRACE, and does not require FDA approval prior to marketing. Next slide. What is an OTC drug monograph? An OTC monograph is a kind of rule book of conditions for each therapeutic category that describes the active ingredients, uses or indications, doses, route of administration, labeling, and testing for an OTC drug to be considered generally recognized as safe and effective or GRACE. Drugs that are GRACE and meet other requirements in Section 505G of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act can be marketed without a new drug application and without FDA pre-market approval. Certain other drugs can also be marketed under Section 505G. The OTC drug monograph system remains one of the largest and most complex regulatory programs ever under undertaken at FDA. Over 100,000 OTC drug monographs are marketed in the U.S. under OTC monographs. These OTC monographs, or rule books, cover approximately 800 active ingredients for over 1,400 uses. Next slide. The OTC monograph system was changed and modernized in March 2020 when the president signed the CARES Act into law. With monograph reform, hand sanitizers using certain active ingredients may be marketed under the OTC monograph if they follow certain conditions. The permitted OTC monograph active ingredients for hand sanitizers are ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, and benzalkonium chloride. All consumer or healthcare hand rub products containing any other active ingredients require the submission of a new drug application. Next slide. Active ingredient, 
ingredients require additional data to determine whether they are generally recognized as safe and effective or grace for use in hand sanitizers. As with all OTC monograph products, it is the manufacturer's responsibility to ensure their products have been properly tested, that they comply with all applicable regulations and statutes, and that the inactive ingredients used in the product are safe and suitable for the intended use. Next slide. The monograph indication for hand sanitizers is a very general one to help reduce bacteria that potentially can cause disease. The products are intended for use when soap and water are not available. We get a lot of questions about the claims that are permitted on the label of hand sanitizers. Some examples of claims that are not permitted include any claims that suggest persistence or duration of effect as a claim, such as a claim that the product lasts up to 24 hours, as well as any pathogen specific disease claims, including antiviral claims, and any superiority claims to another product or type of product. Next slide. The consumer hand sanitizer market has dramatically changed since the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, the consumer hand sanitizer market was fairly small with annual dollar sales of around $190 million. In comparison, according to the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, non-prescription sales of sun care products in 2019 were $1.2 billion and upper respiratory products were more than $9 billion. The hand sanitizer market was mostly made up of small businesses and an overwhelming percentage of products used ethanol as the active ingredient. Since the public health emergency, these products have been flying off the shelves and use has been dramatically increased. Unfortunately, unlike with prescription drugs, it is very difficult to quantify the degree of market shortage, but it has been clear that supply was unable to keep up with the marked increase in demand. Next slide. In order to address the demand for hand sanitizer, FDA issued three guidance documents outlining temporary policies to provide flexibility to help meet demand. When the public health emergency is over, FDA intends to discontinue these enforcement discretion policies and withdraw the guidances. We are continually assessing the needs and circumstances related to the temporary policy and will update, modify, or withdraw the policy as appropriate. For example, in response to new data and questions from manufacturers, we have updated these temporary guidances five times so far, most recently on February 10th, to note that the policy does not apply to products for which FDA has identified a safety concern, including those that are subject to an FDA import alert. We will discuss the FDA countrywide import alert placed on alcohol-based hand sanitizers from Mexico later in this presentation. Next slide. This slide lists the three guidances that I just described. Under these guidances, entities that are not currently registered drug manufacturers can register and make alcohol-based hand sanitizers Pharmacies and registered outsourcing facilities can compound certain alcohol-based hand sanitizers, and alcohol production firms can produce alcohol for making hand sanitizers, provided they follow the conditions outlined. These guidances apply to both consumer and healthcare antiseptic hand rub products, but not to any other type of OTC antiseptic product. Next slide. FDA has continued to work to update our temporary guidances on hand sanitizers to provide additional clarification on the manufacturing of certain alcohol-based hand sanitizer products to both increase supply and help ensure that harmful levels of impurities are not present in hand sanitizer. 
Since FDA published its hand sanitizer guidances in March 2020, thousands of new firms have registered to manufacture alcohol-based hand sanitizers. And hand sanitizer active ingredients, namely ethanol and isopropyl alcohol, with increased supply available from these producers, FDA has heard that many hospital systems are now able to source an adequate supply of hand sanitizer, and consumers may be able to find more alcohol-based hand sanitizer for purchase. Next slide. Unfortunately, with the dramatically increased use of hand sanitizers, a flood of new products on the market and a resultant reduced supply of USP-grade ethanol and isopropyl alcohol, we have seen a variety of new and increasing safety issues with hand sanitizers. I'll mention them here, then review some safety issues in more detail in the remainder of my talk. One of the first things we saw was a rapid uptick in the calls to poison control centers about accidental ingestion of hand sanitizers primarily in young children. There have also been increases in eye injuries and burns from hand sanitizer catching on fire. More recently, we are seeing a large increase in contamination of these products with poisons and toxic chemicals, as well as subpotent and mislabeled products, such as those that claim to be edible alcohol. In January, 2021, we published a guidance on testing for methanol in all pharmaceutical alcohol. We also put out a countrywide import alert for all alcohol-based hand sanitizers from Mexico, which is a first for FDA for a drug product and emphasizes the seriousness of our concern. Next slide. FDA has put out a large number of communications to the public about the risks of hand sanitizer contaminated with methanol and has published on our website a list of hand sanitizer products that consumers should not use. The link to FDA's do not use list is on the slide. The list is designed to allow consumers to determine if they had inadvertently purchased a product FDA has determined is unsafe. The list includes products that have been tested by FDA and found to contain methanol or 1-propanol, or that have been made at the same facility as such products, that are labeled to contain methanol, that have been tested and found to have microbial contamination, that are being recalled by the manufacturer, that are subpotent, or are packaged in a container resembling a food or beverage and present an increased risk of accidental ingestion. To further get the word out on methanol contamination, we reached out to a variety of stakeholder groups, including public health groups dealing with addiction and mental health services, to try to reach those vulnerable groups who may be drinking these products as an alcohol substitute. Next slide. Because consumers may not be familiar with what to look for on a label and the steps they should take to find products on the do not use list, we also have a neat infographic that walks people through how to do it. You can search by project, product name, company name, and national drug code or NDC number. This information is also available on our website in Spanish, Simplified Chinese, Korean, Tagalog and Vietnamese. Next slide. This is the second half of the graphic, which reminds consumers to check the list frequently for updates. It also shows consumers what to do with contaminated hand, san hand sanitizer. Methanol containing hand sanitizer should be disposed of in a hazardous waste collection and not put in the regular trash or poured down the drain. Next slide. It is important that hand sanitizer be stored out of the reach of children 
and children should only use it with adult supervision. As I mentioned, we have seen a substantial increase in calls to poison control centers about accidental ingestion of hand sanitizers, primarily in young children. A 79% increase in the first month of the pandemic compared to the same time in 2019. This is not surprising since many adults are unaware that hand sanitizer should be kept out of reach of children. A CDC internet survey of 502 U.S. adults showed only 54% understood that hand sanitizers should be kept out of reach of children. Children are more vulnerable to the hypoglycemic effects of alcohol toxicity and can get into trouble with much lower blood alcohol levels than would affect an adult. Given the high concentration of alcohol in these products, two and a half teaspoons can be potentially lethal in an 18 month old. If a child ingests hand sanitizer, poison control or a medical professional should be called immediately. Next slide. All ethyl alcohol used in hand sanitizer must contain a denaturant. The denatured alcohol makes the hand sanitizer taste bad, so children will not want to continue once they've had a taste. Next slide. Specific denatured formulas are identified in the FDA COVID-19 hand sanitizer guidances, as well as in the Code of Federal Regulations or on the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau website. There are two preferred denaturant formulas listed in the FDA COVID-19 hand sanitizer guidances, and both include denatonium benzoate, which has a bitter, unpleasant taste and low toxicity. The denaturants in the alternative formulas listed in the guidance are sucrose octaacetate, isopropyl alcohol, and triethyl citrate. We have been asked about unpleasant odors in hand sanitizers and whether denaturants may be a cause. While the denaturants in these formulas are unpleasant to taste, they do not have strong odors. Denatonium benzoate and sucrose octaacetate are described as odorless. Triethyl citrate is also described by the USDA as odorless and many of us are familiar with the odor of isopropyl alcohol in its use as rubbing alcohol. Denaturants added to pharmaceutical alcohol used in hand sanitizer are different from denaturants in general use, since denaturants used in hand sanitizer, like all excipients, must be safe and suitable for the intended use. For example, Methanol is listed in the regulations of the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau as a denaturant for general use, but since it is a poison, it is not safe and suitable for use in hand sanitizer products. Next slide. Because children are more vulnerable to the hypoglycemic effects of alcohol toxicity, we have been insistent that denaturants be added to alcohol used in hand sanitizer products. We are particularly concerned with products using packaging that may be attractive to children, such as food and drink containers or products resembling sweets. We also strongly urge manufacturers to avoid food flavors scents, and bright colors, which might encourage drinking. It might sound like a great idea from a marketing perspective to flavor your product with chocolate, but it is a really bad move from a safety perspective. Here are examples of a product on our do not use list that has been recalled. These products contain cartoon images that are appealing to children. Images of licensed cartoon characters have been removed from the slide image for purposes of this webinar, but you can view the full packaging, including the images at the FDA link on the slide. 
This packaging closely resembles that of popular children's fruit snacks and can easily be confused. This product was associated with a news report from Canada of an adult family member who gave the product to an 18 month old thinking it was food. While the child ended up in the emergency department, he unfortunately had, he fortunately had a full recovery. Next slide. Methanol has been found to be a contaminant in hand sanitizer products. Methanol exposure can result in nausea, vomiting, headache, blurred vision, permanent blindness, seizures, coma, permanent damage to the nervous system, or death. Although people using these products on their hands are at risk for methanol poisoning, young children who accidentally ingest these products and adolescents and adults who drink these products as an ethanol substitute are most at risk. This slide provides an illustrative example of the types of adverse events we're seeing reported. This comes from a CDC report of a case series of 15 people in Arizona and New Mexico who were hospitalized after swallowing hand sanitizer containing methanol. Of these, four people died Three were discharged with vision loss, including permanent blindness. Four remained hospitalized, and only four of the 15 were discharged with no complications. It is also important to note that it takes only a very small amount of methanol to be toxic. It takes ingestion of only 25 milliliters, or less than two tablespoons, of pure methanol to be potentially lethal to an adult. The amount is even lower in children, taking just three milliliters, which is a little over a half teaspoon to be potentially lethal to an 18 month old child. It takes even less to cause blindness. Due to the risk of serious toxicity, including death, FDA is taking issues regarding methanol and other contamination very seriously. Next slide. As stated by Dr. Janet Woodcock, Acting Commissioner of Food and Drugs, in her 2019 testimony before the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, we still face some challenges in ensuring the safety of imported drugs entering our drug supply. Under our current authorities, foreign-based manufacturers of certain drugs can legally ship drugs to the United States without ever having been inspected by FDA. Drugs in this category typically include OTC monograph drugs. This requires resource intensive efforts on FDA's part to identify and respond to any problems that will arise subsequently. Product screenings at the US border are an example of these resource intensive efforts. Methanol substitution in hand sanitizer was first identified through customs and FDA screening at the U.S.-Mexican border. Next slide. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have experienced a spike in demand for ethanol with subsequent supply shortages and increases in price. In the context of this situation, in many methanol contaminated hand sanitizers, less expensive methanol is substituted for more expensive ethanol. The pattern looks like other substitution cases that FDA has encountered historically. For example, diethylene glycol in glycerin and oversulfated chondroitin sulfate in heparin. Next slide. FDA has taken multiple actions when encountering hand sanitizers that consumers should not use. As previously discussed, FDA has published a do not use list on the FDA website. FDA has contacted manufacturers about taking market action to limit patient exposure. Warning letters have been issued and FDA has maintained continuing heightened surveillance of hand sanitizers 
both imported and domestically produced. Next slide. Methanol has been found in, to be a contaminant in hand sanitizer products in numerous locations worldwide. In particular, FDA has seen a sharp increase in hand sanitizer products from Mexico that were labeled to contain ethanol, but tested positive for methanol contamination. FDA's analyses of alcohol-based hand sanitizers imported from Mexico found 84% of the samples analyzed by the agency from April through December 2020 were not in compliance with the FDA's regulations. More than half of the samples were found to contain toxic ingredients, including methanol and or 1-propanol at dangerous levels. FDA has placed all alcohol-based hand sanitizers from Mexico on a countrywide import alert, under which these products are subject to heightened FDA scrutiny before entering the U.S. Next slide. FDA is also concerned that other drug products containing ethanol or isopropyl alcohol could be similarly vulnerable to methanol contamination. For example, certain inhalation products, mouthwashes, cough and cold products, and many topical drug products include pharmaceutical alcohol. FDA has issued a guidance outlining the agency's policy for drug manufacturers and compounders to test ethanol or isopropyl alcohol for methanol contamination prior to using the alcohol to produce drugs, including hand sanitizer products. Next slide. We started seeing one propanol contamination of hand sanitizers a few months after the first cases of methanol contamination. And we have several products on our do not use list due to 1-propanol. While 1-propanol is similar to isopropanol, it is not the same chemical entity and should not be used in hand sanitizers. Animal studies show that the central nervous system depressant effects of 1-propanol are two to four times as potent as ethanol. Therefore, we are very concerned that if someone were to drink hand sanitizer labeled as containing ethanol, but instead contains 1-propanol, they may end up in rapidly intoxicated and stop breathing. Skin or eye exposure to 1-propanol is also very irritating, and there have been rare case reports of allergic skin reactions as well. Poisoning from 1-propanol may be difficult to detect since the clinical effects overlap with the effects seen in ethanol poisoning. Next slide. Ocular injury is another safety issue that is being reported with the increase in hand sanitizer use during the COVID-19 pandemic. While this issue is relevant to all age groups, recent publications have focused on ocular injuries in children. In an FDA study of US Poison Control Center data from children five years of age or younger during the COVID-19 pandemic, 50% of hand sanitizer exposures with clinical effects considered to be related to the product or ocular exposures. During the COVID-19 pandemic, alcohol-based hand sanitizer dispensers have become more widely available in public spaces. These dispensers often deliver hand sanitizer at the level of small children's eyes, and this has resulted in cases of ocular exposure and injury. A study of data from poison control centers in France reported 63 pediatric ocular hand sanitizer exposure cases in public places from April to August of 2020, compared to no cases reported during those months in 2019. These exposures occurred most frequently in stores and malls. While most hand sanitizer ocular exposed exposures generally result in no symptoms or mild symptoms, more serious effects can occur. 
a study of data from a French pediatric ophthalmology hospital referral center reported eight cases of corneal or conjunctival ulceration after ocular hand sanitizer exposure. In six of these cases, the ulceration involved more than 50% of the corneal surface. Ethanol has recognized effects on the cornea. It exerts a cytotoxic effect on corneal epithelial cells, and 20% diluted ethanol solution is used to facilitate epithelial debridement in various ophthalmologic procedures. Next slide. Another hand sanitizer safety issue is flammability. FDA has advised consumers that hand sanitizer is flammable and that it should be rubbed into hands until they feel completely dry before continuing activities that may involve heat, sparks, static electricity, or open flames. Despite that, Fires associated with hand sanitizer use have been reported. In one case, a Texas woman lit a candle after applying hand sanitizer and suffered severe burns. In other cases, static electricity resulted in fires, which occurred in a variety of settings, including a laboratory and in hospitals. Given the extreme flammability of alcohol-based hand sanitizers, Putting hand sanitizers in formulations particularly prone to flammability, such as aerosol sprays, is not a good idea. We have examples of severe burns associated with aerosol spray formulations of sunscreen. Next slide. This brings me to the end of this presentation. Here are some FDA resources if you have additional questions on hand sanitizers after this webinar. They include the hand sanitizer do not use list that we discussed. There is also a consumer update on safely using hand sanitizers, which was just updated last week. It has new information, including advice to consumers to apply hand sanitizer in areas with adequate ventilation. In addition, there is a Q&A webpage for consumers and a hand sanitizer quiz that has been designed for consumers and can be used as a fun and interactive way to learn more about hand sanitizers. Next slide. And finally, this is a list of publications referenced in my slides. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to our panel discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Mentari. Uh, I'm going to uh, start to go through the Q&A and uh, uh, I'll invite Dr. Michelle to jump in at, uh, at any time. Um, uh, let me start with some of the questions that have come up on the Q&A panel. Uh, and please don't hesitate to add your question if, if it comes up. Uh, one of the first questions that came up uh, was about the expiration date uh, for hand and sanitizer, uh, does hand sanitizer expire and should we discard it after the date? Dr. Mentari, I think you're on mute uh, and Dr. Michelle as well. So you can go ahead and. Drug products generally must list an uh, expiration date unless they have data showing that they have been stable for more than three years. Um, hand sanitizers that are used under the rules of the temporary guidance may not have an expiration date because we expect them to be used within the duration of the public health emergency. Dr. Michelle, do you have anything to add? I think you covered it. So basically, yes, hand sanitizers do expire. If you have one that's been sitting on your shelf for more than three years, you should get rid of it. And um, particularly if you have one that appears to have broken down or um, developed a bad odor, we don't recommend using it. Right, thank you. Um, another question was about whether hand sanitizers, uh, uh, different versions of it anyway, should be used for people with sensitive skin. Uh, obviously, there are different ingredients in different products. Uh, are there any specific recommendations there from the FDA? 
So I'll take that question. Um, so we don't recommend any particular products. All hand sanitizers that are alcohol-based contain either isopropyl alcohol or ethanol, as you heard from Dr. Mentari. And we all know that those are drying to the skin. Some hand sanitizers have uh, different emollients in them. It's important that manufacturers test those hand sanitizers to make sure that whatever ingredients they're adding um, do not change the underlying properties of the hand sanitizer. So um, really, we can't recommend a particular one. So it's up to the consumer to see which one works for them. We do recommend that if you choose a hand sanitizer, number one, you should make sure it's not on our do not use list. And uh, that note that the CDC recommends using hand sanitizers only when soap and water are not available for consumers. Right, okay. Um, there's a, another question about whether uh, colloidal silver is an effective hand sanitizer. Uh, silver, as, as most people know uh, in this uh, audience perhaps, uh, silver can be uh, an effective uh, antimicrobial. It's, seen in, uh, for example, uh, certain stethoscope uh, diaphragm covers. Uh, do you have any recommendations about that product? Sure, I'll take that question. So there's actually a specific regulation um, stating that silver is not permitted in any topical drug product. And that's because of the toxicity. So no OTC monograph drugs including hand sanitizers are permitted to contain silver. If you do find products on the market with colloidal silver as their active ingredient, they're violative and you shouldn't be purchasing them. Right, thank you. Um, I, there's another question here about the formulation of hand sanitizer. It asks, uh, what are your recommendations uh, in terms of the liquid hand sanitizers versus the foam hand sanitizers. I know in my hospital, there were concerns by the environmental services folks that the, uh, the liquid formulations tended to drip on the floor and dissolve the wax on the, the, uh, on the, the floor and, and that would cause unsightly stains. Whereas the foam tended to remain in place more effectively and didn't drip as much. Uh, do you have any data about uh, the relative efficacy of the foam versus the liquid or gel uh, products? No, we don't have any relative data saying that one particular product is better the, than another. I will comment though that the liquid products are the ones that are discussed in our guidances, our guidances, temporary guidances for the manufacture of hand sanitizers. Uh, during the COVID pandemic are specifically focused on liquid formulations. And that's because there's some basic testing of those formulations by the WHO and the, the formulations are very, very simple. And there's kind of a, a how-to guide put out um, by the WHO for those formulations. So that's why those are in our guidances because we were anticipating that a large number of non-traditional manufacturers would be entering the market using these formulations. For the traditional manufacturers, they're required to test their products. So the burden is on the manufacturer to show the safety and efficacy of the products they produce. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um... I just scrolled by it, but I remember the question. Uh, what do you know about the uh, environmental conditions uh, that might exist, say, in a, uh, a vaccination facility that is outdoors? Uh, are there extremes of uh, heat and cold that might uh, undermine the uh, efficacy of some of these products? You know, one um, temperature limitation of stability of uh, hand sanitizer is that we do not recommend that it be stored in temperatures greater than 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of volatility issues, presumably, that it would uh, start evaporating and, and cause a risk there. Is, is that 
the thought? Yes, that's correct. I see. Um, there's another question here about, um, uh, again, about alternative products. I realize that your focus has been on ethanol, but uh, there is one question about some of the alternatives like uh, containing uh, or hypochlorous acid, I should say. Uh, are, are there any, uh, do you have any data about those products where say environmental conditions might make uh, uh, the ethanol containing products not uh, safe to use? Dr. Mantari, do you want to start with that one? I think they're asking about disinfectant um, I, products. Um, you know, surface disinfectants, uh, such as um, the one mentioned in the question, are not recommended for use on skin. They can potentially be toxic and cause um, skin irritation and damage. Um, so for that reason, both uh, the EPA and FDA do not recommend use on skin. Right, and I'd also just add that there's a there's a real distinction here between things that are intended to use on humans and things that are intended to use not on humans. So surface wipes and other products. So things that are intended to be used on humans are regulated as drugs by the FDA. And um, that's what we're talking about as part of this seminar today. Things that are intended to be used on uh, non-human surfaces are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And the criteria there are very different from what we would expect for a drug product. So you'll see all kinds of claims on those that they prevent, that they um, kill COVID, et cetera. And those are permitted by the EPA based on in vitro tests over a period of say 10 minutes. So it's a, it's a different kind of approach than what FDA uses for our products. And again, as you heard from Dr. Mentari, you should never be putting something like that on your skin. Right. I should also uh, mention I, that early in the pandemic, we had a lot of cases of um, bad outcomes from people who did use surface disinfectants on their skin. Dr. Baum, can I ask a couple of questions, please? Yes, of course. Yeah, go ahead. I um, I was just want to follow up on the skin question. Um, first of all, thank you for this great presentation. Very useful information. Um, there are some um, hand sanitizers that contain benzalkonium uh, benzalkonium chloride, which is a, a quaternary uh, ammonium uh, quaternary ammonium compound. And I remember um, also that we discussed that compound in the setting of um, disinfectants and uh, the risk for skin sensitization. Is there any concern or preference to using non-benzalkonium chloride um, sanitizers in those with skin sensitivity? And I, I, you know, I don't know. If this is a question to uh, Dr. Mentari, Dr. Baum. I know you've also worked in this area as well. I can address that question in a general sense. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control recommend for efficacy purposes, uh, the use of alcohol-based hand sanitizers over benzalkonium-based hand sanitizers. Um, regarding the issue of uh, sensitivity, uh, Dr. Michelle, do you have any uh, words on that? So that's still something that's under evaluation. What most people probably don't realize is that all hand sanitizers um, regardless of which active, which of the three active ingredients um, are still undergoing review by FDA. There's still outstanding data that we're expecting uh, from manufacturers to fill in the gaps uh, to determine that these active ingredients are generally recognized as safe and effective for use in hand sanitizers. Thank you so much. I have just one more question that I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Wax uh, for some questions as well. Um, and this happened to me in my home. Uh, my, my, my spouse had uh, bought a nice bottle of hand sanitizer and then she wanted to refill it with some other product that she bought from a, like a large supply store. 
And she basically emptied one content into another content and made this real weird reaction. Can you comment on mixing these different hand sanitizers together and whether they lose efficacy or, I know it looked really bad when they mixed up together, they clumped up, but maybe you can comment on that and, and turn it over to Dr. Wax after that. Thank you. Well, it is, um, you can see from your personal experience, sometimes uh, mixing of products can result in unintended effects and that's not something that we recommend. Right, and the other issue is of course, if you're mixing different products, you don't know the compatibilities of those products. And once you have breached the container closure of the original product, uh, there's a real issue with alcohol-based hand sanitizers in particular is evaporation. And so we recommend that these products be packaged in containers that have an appropriate seal so that you're not getting evaporation. Um, because of course, if the products do evaporate, you know, you've had it sitting on your windowsill for several years and it's gotten hot and so forth, you can have uh, reduced alcohol content, which could affect the efficacy and potency of the product. Thank you. Dr. Wax? Uh, thank you very much for a really superb uh, pr presentation. These hand sanitizers are approved under the uh, EUA dealing with public health emergency, I assume. Uh, do you have any uh, <laughs> uh, guesstimate about uh, when uh, you know this may change? Will some of these hand sanitizers uh, uh, ultimately go up for full FDA review, or will they just uh, time out after, after the EUA is lifted at some point in the future? Yeah, so I'll speak to that. So in fact, uh, none of these hand sanitizers are marketed under an emergency use authorization. All of the hand sanitizers currently under, on the market are marketed under the terms of the OTC drug review, which is the monograph system that Dr. Mentari so beautifully explained in her presentation. The emergency youth authorization is a product specific authorization that falls um, along the chain of a new drug application. And as I said, um, no one has um, gotten an approved emergency use authorization or NDA for a particular product showing that it prevents or treats COVID. Yeah, I, th I think I'll just turn it back to Dr. Bauman for any uh, last minute questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, there was a question here and, and you may have touched on this uh, before. Uh, again, I scrolled past it and, and so I, I apologize to the author um, who asked it. I don't have the name in front of me, but it was a question about residence time uh, or contact time. I don't know what the proper term is. Uh, it, people will often uh, go to a dispenser, put the uh, the uh, pure, the uh, product on their hand, and then they will uh, rub it a couple of times, and that's it. Uh, do you normally tell people until the hands are dry, or what is the guidance there for contact time? Dr. Mentari, do you want to talk about the directions of use for hand sanitizers and the volumes involved? I think you're on mute, Dr. Mentari. There you go. Um, the, the recommended use for hand sanitizers is to apply, um, you know, a pump and uh, wait until the uh, hand sanitizer is dry. Um, you know, that's both from an efficacy standpoint and also from safety, as, as we mentioned in the, the presentation, you know, if, um, if the hand sanitizer is still wet on the hands, um, there's the issue of flammability. And we've heard of cases where uh, people have had severe burns due to exposure to sparks or static electricity. Very good. Well, uh, I think we, we need to uh, wrap it up now. Uh, I just wanna thank our, our guest moderator, Dr. Teresa Michelle, and our guest speaker, Dr. Evelyn Mentari for their uh, thorough presentation and, uh, and this excellent discussion. Um, thank you for joining us and for enlightening us on this important topic. And uh, I hope that everyone will uh, come back uh, to our uh, future uh, 
discussions, uh, webinars, and uh, we'll we'll see you all again. And we have, we have another uh, just a couple concluding slides, uh, and I and I would like to uh, you know thank um, again our speakers, our moderator, Dr. Baum, um, the support of uh, uh, ATSDR, and uh, I think it's it's been uh, really uh, great information uh, to transmit and. To, to get the information you know, from the FDA uh, is uh, really a, a, some definitive advice to all of us, and I, I really appreciate them to, uh, to take their time. Um, so this um, is, um, as I mentioned, the, now the third webinar in our special uh, web series about uh, disinfectants, and that will continue uh, with a, a, another webinar upcoming uh, over the summer. We do plan to continue our, our general uh, COVID webinar series over the next uh, several months as uh, we ad address issues uh, of concern. All this can be found in our uh, prospectus on the medical and public health consideration of COVID-19, which is available on our website. Uh, thanks again, and everyone uh, should uh, have a good day. And don't forget to visit the Pacey National Classroom with a lot of good information. Thank you. Thank you.